Okay, so thank you. So, uh, on behalf of the International Astronautical Federation, it is uh, for me this afternoon a great pleasure to welcome you at the first uh, ISC 2017 plenary event, which is uh, the traditional heads of agencies uh, plenary. And uh, the theme for this year's plenary is uh, business before science or science before business. I'm sure that uh, you will answer both, but uh, we will discuss about the order. And uh, before we dive into the discussion, I would like uh, just shortly explain how we will run the event. In fact, uh, the event will be divided into three main sections. I will be moderating the first part and I will invite the panelists to give a free four minutes presentation related to the theme. The second part will be moderated by my friend Jan Werner, IAF Vice President for Agency Parliamentary and Ministerial Relations, who is also, as you know, Director General of the European Space Agency, and uh, he will ask uh, various questions and uh, he will engage the panelists into a lively discussion. And uh, finally, we will continue with uh, an interactive uh, Q&A session with uh, the audience. So this is uh, the scheme for the afternoon, and uh, I propose that uh, we start with our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Robert Lightfoot, Administrator of NASA. Robert. Okay, well, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, it is great to be here um, with my colleagues, and, and first and foremost, I want to say uh, how pleased I was to hear the announcement this morning for an Australian Space Agency. I think that is awesome. I very much look forward to one of them having to sit up here next year and do this uh, as we go forward. So that'll be exciting. Um, you know, we talked about a theme as the new forms of business partnerships and, and traditional science activities for us up here. Uh, how are we looking at it? And in the answer of, of business before science or science before business. And those of you that know me know I hate the word or. It's about and, right? This is not a science or business. It's science and business. And we've got to think about it that way. Um, and I look. The different ways that we're doing things in this, in this, in, in NASA and, and with all the other agencies is, is important. And science is important, business is important, but you know what's most important? The reason I chose this picture, because they only gave us three pictures. So I chose this one because science and business are important, but it's about our people. It's all about our people. It's about the folks here that are doing the work every day that make, us, make this happen. Um, but these are our, these are, this is our new crew of uh, astronaut candidates that we selected this summer. Um, in the U.S., out of uh, 18,000 folks, we got down to 12. Um, if you want to feel inadequate, read their bios. Um, pretty amazing, pretty amazing folks here. But the whole point is, though, what we've done in NASA is we've looked at multiple ways to do our business, different ways that we can do business over, over, over the range of uh, the years. Go back in time when NASA was formed, roughly 100% of the dollars used in uh, to get to space and explore space were all done from a government perspective, and now somewhere around 25%. It's a very very different environment we're in, and we need to take that into consideration. We've invested from our place in, at NASA. We've invested in commercial space flight. Um, we have, we're going to have, we've had it for cargo to the International Space Station, but we also have it for crew coming up pretty soon with uh, Boeing and, and SpaceX. So we're, we're looking at all those models. Those models are available to us. The other thing, though, that people need to realize about NASA is it, it really is a, a matter of us. We we only keep. 15% of our dollars inside, 18% or 85% go out, and we fund industry, we fund commercial, and we do partnerships with these folks here. So I think while the government always needs to be working on those things that are far out, the, the, the horizon activities like getting to Mars, um, there is room for a commercial evolution over time, depending on those commercial capabilities are available to us. So that, that to me is important. We're building the Space Launch System in Orion to actually move us out further, um, and we'll continue that human push further. The other piece, though, when you talk about at, after you move past the human stuff, is when you go to science. Let's see if we can get this to work. Mm, what am I supposed to point at? Next chart for anybody that's driving the bus. Mm. Next, slide. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, you may have heard this last week. Um, this is Cassini's view of uh, Saturn. What an amazing mission. And I'm just not sure there's a business case around this kind of work. 
in terms of, of a proposition, but this is what we do. This is the discovery of knowledge, the advancement of knowledge that's very important. But what the business case is here is inspiring that next generation, bringing that next group of explorers to the table. And to us, that's one of the most important things we do at NASA, is making sure we bring those explorers forward with our scientific missions and even the human missions that we do. So that is the business that we're in from that perspective going forward. And then my last one, before I get off here, one next chart, please. There we go. So I was fortunate enough to be with Thomas Zubrucken, our science head, um, on, a, on an aircraft 25,000 feet above the Pacific just off the coast of Oregon when the eclipse came on board here uh, August 21st. The inspirational val value of what we do, the educational value of what we do, while I had to convince my team NASA didn't create the eclipse, um, it just happens. We even got a note from someone that says, why are y'all doing this on a Monday? Can't you do it on the weekend? Anyway, um, but the, the value of engaging the public, the value of engaging that next generation is the business of what we do. That's where science and business intersect because those, those people we engage, those people we inspire are going to be the next generation that join us here, join you there, and help us to get the goals that we got to go. So that's what I think from a science and business perspective, and thank you for the time. Okay, so thank you, Robert, for this uh, very insightful presentation, and our next speaker is uh, Jan Werner. Okay, so I hope my mic is also working. So next, okay, now it's working. Please, the next slide. So for me, okay, no, this is not mine, but it's, it's nice. Uh, I would also talk about that if necessary, because, uh, but I have my own uh, uh, picture. I hope you can move to the next one, please. It should work, uh, because it's quite similar to what uh, Robert was showing, it's, but it is different, therefore we need it. Please, can you go to the next picture, please? Yes, that is. So it is one picture, and I have only one picture, but if you look on this picture, what do you see? You see the Earth, you see the Moon, and you see an astronaut. And so these three items are what I think is really about business, science, and technology. So first of all, we see the Earth with a very thin atmosphere, so we can make people aware of what is happening to our planet. So the thin atmosphere we have to secure. So this is already part one. Part two is the moon. The moon, for a sense for me here for exploration, to go beyond lower orbit, to go abroad, to go really in our solar system and maybe even further. And then we have here an astronaut, not just an astronaut, but if you look a little bit more into this, you see something very special. First of all, you see it is international. She is not an Italian astronaut, it's Samantha Cristoforetti, it's a European astronaut with an Italian accent. So, it is a European astronaut, and she is wearing a Russian spacesuit. She is in the BATA, we call that BATA, with NASA, so we pay to NASA through a BATA, so it's flying, so to say, on a ticket of NASA, paid by the European Space Agency, and she flew to the European, uh, to the International Space Agency, uh, to the International Space Station, from the European Space uh, Agency, and what she has over here is a small flower from the steppe of Kazakhstan. And if you see her face, you see what she believes. She is saying it smells so nicely over here, much better than in the International Space Station. So she is telling us something like inspiration, fascination, and through that, and through that, I'm totally agree in agreement with Robert, you get also motivation. Only if you are fascinated and inspired, you, get, you are really motivated. And therefore, science before uh, business or business before science is the same question as hen or egg. You need both at the same time, and I would add a third uh, expression, and this is technology. Through technology, International Space Station, for example, you can do science. And if you do the science on board, you can do business with it. And the other way around, you, just through the business, you again, you can uh, fertilize also the science and the technology. So for me, it's very clear, business before science, science before business, we need both, we have to do both, 
and in addition, by using both, we can really inspire people to do even more than just their own job in this, uh, a specific area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. And uh, now, uh, Sylvain Laporte from the Canadian Space Agency. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, that went a lot faster than for my colleague Jan, so I guess I... Hmm. Um, first of all, I think congratulations to all of our Australian colleagues for the announcement of the Space Agency. I think that's fantastic news. Don't know what the timeline is to set everything up, but uh, without wanting to create a, a diplomatic event, it would sure be nice if the, uh, heads of, uh, the head of the new agency um, could join us uh, next year in Bremen at the uh, heads of agency uh, panel. So no hurry, but uh, we'll be waiting for uh, him or her in Bremen to join us on stage. Okay, that being said, um, next slide please. So I'd like to talk about the, uh, the theme of this uh, session, which is uh, business before science or science before business. Um, and I want to approach it with a premise. Um, premise being that we've got, you know, a, a proliferation now of, of very successful business models, and that's requiring a lot of change. Um, and when I look at the advent of these business models, in fact, um, I'd like to approach the theme of, uh, of this discussion a bit differently and state it, uh, in my own words, as something like it's business for science and science for business, but neither one before the other. So let me explain how, how that goes. So when I look at science, um, it helps us explain and understand the world around us and it allows us to um, innovate and evolve. Space is a unique laboratory for that, which requires fundamental and applied sciences. And as a space community, we're both a consumer of disruptive technologies and a creator of such technologies. And I think that long gone are the days of linear scientific development. So I believe the greatest advances for humanity, the true groundbre groundbreaking new world ideas happen when different disciplines come together in a truly creative, collaborative, and diverse environment. For transformation change to happen, people need to think exponentially. Individuals from diverse backgrounds augmented by collective thinking can achieve great things beyond their reach alone. Tomorrow's business models will need to be interdisciplinary, international, intercultural, and intergenerational. Next slide. The dynamics of the international space programs are changing. Agency roles will remain important, but they will not be exclusive because of great changes afoot. There are many business models out there that we could have talked about, and I decided to pick one, and I think it's quite appropriate to pick it because I believe this side of the audience on the bottom seems to be all of our, of our young people, and I've picked a business model that is appealing to young people. Now, no disrespect for that side of the room, but you're all wearing ties and you all have gray hair like me, so that's fine. I'm addressing my briefing to the rest of the audience on this side. Um, so I've decided to, uh, to talk about you know, a new generation of young entrepreneurial scientists that are pushing innovation and creating new kinds of businesses. A generation thriving on collaboration, but through open science to accelerate discoveries. They will select the science that moves forward, waiving market fit and risk, and navigate the culturally diverse worlds of science and business for them to be a successful entrepreneur. We have an example of that in Canada, a company called GHGSAT. It's a consortium, small business, large business, folks of varied backgrounds, engineers, scientists, uh, business people, legal and, and whatnot. They recognized the market opportunity and went for it. They gave themselves a vision to be the global reference for measuring GHG emissions by industrial facilities. 
They developed a nanosat satellite called Claire that they launched in 2016. And this satellite takes about 200,000 atmospheric measurements covering a six kilometer radius around an industrial site. They were quite successful uh, as, a, as a business. Building on their success, they're now developing two new satellites that are going to offer even more services to their customers worldwide. The reason why I bring this up is to speak to or illustrate the, the, uh, the idea of the entrepreneurial scientists. Because in essence, these folks identified the market need, they developed the new technologies, they adopted an entrepreneurial approach, and developed a successful business. So the CSA, my agency, provided early stage R&D support, but it was the entrepreneurs that made the decisions on science and business. Next slide, please. Versatility is key to global markets. In Canada, we're training our scientists in business and marketing. At the CSA, for example, we started a CubeSat competition for university students where they're going to build and design the scientific payload themselves. They will select the payload. They're going to have to manage a budget, and they're going to have to develop a business case to um, convince investors to provide additional funding for them. This business model fosters the scientific entrepreneurs of the future. We also have in the room today approximately 10 students from across Canada, and we've brought them to the IAC as a developmental opportunity because we believe that today's students are tomorrow's entrepreneurial scientists who will decide whether we do science for business or business for science, but neither one before the other. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sylvain. And uh, now we have uh, our friend from uh, the China National Space Administration, Tian Yulong. The clicker should work now. It should work. Not a work. This one should work. Okay. Should work because uh, that was mentioned here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of Mr. Tang Dengjie, Administrator of CSA, it is my great pleasure to attend this the plenary event. The title for, yes, yes. for this event is the, about the priority of space science and uh, exploration and the commercial space. This is a challenging question, I think so. From my point of view, the answer will be different as per different conditions in different countries. There are space development forces and development levels. I would like to share the experience of China space. With the 60 years of development, we have gone through forces. They are industry technology innovation, first time. Then space exploration. Now, currently, de commercial development. Space science and technology and scientific exploration have formed space infra infrastructure and the capabilities, including the long March service vehicle, various types of satellite, and uh, human space flight, lunar exploration, and more. Those are the fundamental conditions for space science and commercial space to development. The development of China space shows a path that space technology and space exploration go before commercial space. Currently, global space enters a new era where space exploration and commercial space uh, with the most innovative vitality and challenges. Well, commercial space countries worldwide hope to forge a space new aging to form a new industry, new economy. By pulling up the resource and investmental from the government departments and the business and the enterprise, especially private company, Great support are provided for more challenging 
space exploration activities, especially for deep exploration. The materially beneficial commercial space and space exploration will witness uh, an integrated development. For sure, the joint cooperation, joint operation on lunar Mars exploration and the collaborative setup for the favorable policy environmental for the commercial space require joint effort for, from all space agents. Thank you. So thank you. I would like now to invite uh, Igor Komarov from Roscosmos to give his presentation. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank people sitting here and uh, organize of this meeting for this opportunity to, to be here and to talk. And uh, what I want to say for this particular situation, that, that is, it's uh, hard to hear sitting on the stage what other uh, colleagues speak. So I want to uh, apologize if I to the audience if I repeat something, because I haven't heard exactly what they said. And I want to, uh, by chance, apologize to them if I contradict in something that <laughs> to they, to they said, but I try not to do this. Actually, I haven't prepared the, the, the special presentation to this, I think, that uh, general issue. And uh, uh, I've heard uh, of very few words I understood is words of Jan Werner that said uh, business and science they, they should uh, go together that goes without saying so uh, and uh, but you know traditionally I think also goes without saying that the science was first uh, in one week we are going to celebrate in particular in Russia a very big event for the space history and uh, this, this is the launch of the first satellite, Sputnik, that was launched 60 years ago uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, was it business or science? It was a challenge, first of all. And uh, also it was pure science. But who could imagine that this small satellite that was launched sent a very simple signal, beep, beep, but in the future it would be the basis for the telecommunication that we have now and for the huge constellations of, uh, of the satellites which serve for Earth observation, for telecommunication, for navigation. So that was a breakthrough that was done 60 years ago and opened a new era uh, in uh, space research and business. So traditionally, uh, science, uh, uh, did people think that there would be a payback, there would be development and some results in business and profit? For sure not. And most events, and we working in space understand that a lot of things that are developed now hardly predict now what would be the impact for our lives. But the history that exists now for these 60 years from the launch of the first Sputnik, we understand that it will come for sure. And new challenges we face, new uh, space exp uh, explorations that we make, and scientific research, for sure they will bring the results. That now it works. But if we look now from this 60 year history, we see now that there are uh, different, on the opposite side there are again examples, in particular, say in pharmaceuticals. One due to some uh, research and uh, trying to invent some med med medicines. Business come to ISS, to space, for microgravity, for the conditions we have in space, to make some new medicals. And uh, they have a very good results. Also, we see that now business play quite different role than it was before because it put very tough pressure on the conditions and for, for, the, for, the, for the launches. The reduction of cost, 
uh, inventing new methods and uh, new, new technologies that will bring new benefits for the end users and reduce the cost. So we see that it is exactly the situation when they, they go together. And uh, our purpose, see, uh, the people who sit here, is to make it more close. Because the closer they are, science and business, the better results we have, the faster we benefit from, from uh, these results. It is interesting to understand that now when we uh, talk about uh, science and business, business, we understand the business we make on Earth. Next stage we're going to face. We, are not, we haven't reached the, the stage when we talk about the business, as specific business in space, as its own. We are not even close to that. And I think our task for the next decade to make everything possible, to come closer, closer to, to, the, to the business in space, to make this environment, to, to discuss the project and profitability and payback of the projects existing in space, not in the connection with the Earth and uh, having results there. That is our purpose and the targets of <coughs> our colleagues. That's uh, what we are working for and uh, that's why we need very close cooperation in uh, de developing that. And I hope that by the end of next decade, we will see what, what we have got. Thank you. So thank you, thank you Igor. Now uh, we can move to the next speaker, uh, Sumanat, from uh, Indian Space Research Organization. Thank you for this opportunity to present my agency's views on this topic that you have given today. Uh, Indian Space Organization started uh, working in the science, observations, building some instruments, and launching some satellites, early 60s, 70s. But later we built bigger satellites, and finally the ability to launch them through our own rockets. So the, uh, the effort was in building the space assets over many years. Today we have uh, three of those satellites, uh, launch vehicles uh, currently operating and also a host of satellites which are there in orbit for both S observation, communication as well as for navigation. Meantime, while we build this infrastructure, uh, the effort was still on working on science. The two of, three of the important science missions were the Chandrayaan-1, the Mars Orbiter mission and the AstroSat for the recent times. And AstroSat completed two years as a space observatory. We had almost 400 observations. And the science data is going to be released to the entire uh, uh, world uh, immediately. The Mars Orbital mission has completed three years around Mars. It's doing fantastic even today. Uh, also, various technology science experiments have been going on. I won't go into that. Next slide, please. Last year, our effort was in creating a lot of infrastructure. Actually, the requirement of the national demand has been so high. So we have, uh, we have been working on launching many communication satellites called GSAT 9, 17, 18, 19, and also Earth observation satellites in the series Kato Sat and Resource Sat. And almost 130 small satellites we have launched for commercial purposes from 19 countries over the years. Next slide, please. The PSLV continued to remain as one of our reliable launchers. We had 39 successful flights. One of the important highlights we want to give here is the launch of 104 satellites in one go, where we, the three satellites were from India and 101 satellites from six countries. Okay, this commercial aspect of this launch was in terms of monetary benefits, it may be small, but it is an opportunity to uh, small satellite provider service as a piggyback launch in large numbers. So this is the capability that we offer in the business side. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, the two launchers, the GSLV and GSLA Mark III, the GSLA Mark III is the latest of the launcher. The first launch was successful, and we put a communication satellite called GSAT-9. It is a high-throughput satellite. Uh, and also, the GSA, GSLV launched GSAT-9. Uh, it is a cooperation among the South Asian countries, seven of our neighbors. And we provide this satellite as a support to do a lot of disaster management, uh, meteorological data sharing, and scientific research, VSATs, telemedicine, and all that. 
Next slide. <coughs> Uh, our purpose in the organization is to promote the use of space in the nation building, which includes uh, a geospatial governance and also disaster risk reduction, looking at the sustainable development theme at different sectors, the food security, the shelter, the health security, the infrastructure, water resources, energy security. So all this put together can be done through space, as all of you know. We have a host of um, the remote sensing satellite, the navigation satellites, the communication satellite, the whole data we merge into uh, the portal, which is an India-specific geoportal called Bhuvan. Uh, it's going to be the one on, uh, on the basis on which the entire nation building, uh, asset mapping, the resources mapping, the, geo, the centralized planning uh, are going to be done. It's a really a, a big tool that is going to revolutionize the way we use the satellites in our country, which can be emulated elsewhere. And on this platform also we see a whole, whole lot of business opportunity developed in using the space products as a base for development. And on the science side, which I have, I'm not going to explain here, we have a host of the science missions going to happen in the coming years. The Aditi L1 is in 2019, the Venus mission in 2023, the Chandrayaan 2 in 2018, and Mars Orbiter mission 2 in 2020. A whole lot of research, uh, development works are going on. And I'm sure unless you create this uh, type of infrastructure and te technology with you, you can't explore the, uh, more on the science. And the business side, we are going to look at the transferring our launch vehicle technology to a commercial enterprise and make it make an Indian industry capable of handling the whole production and launch services. Thank you so much. So thank you. And uh, now, last but not least, uh, Okumura-san from JAXA in Japan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, actually, the question, the uh, business before science or science before business uh, seems to me extremely interesting one. In my view, this is not about choosing either, but we should understand that business and science are mutually complementary and that they will spiral up while complementing each other. In the recent days, with the remarkable progress of science and technology, this trend is particularly strong. Let me give you an example. Historically speaking, the basic science of quantum mechanics has fostered the creation of new technologies, such as laser technologies. Various technologies have made progress based on this principle, and thus new electronics businesses have emerged and developed. Once commercialized, Companies must strive to further enhance technologies in order to win the fierce battle of competition in the market. As a result, technology itself will get enhanced and become finer by using that leading edge technology to solve problems of basic science. The discovery of new knowledge can be expected. One example is that Advanced laser technology is nowadays being used for basic research on detecting gravitational waves. Uh, we can expect the same uh, to happen in space innovation for satellite positioning technology by applying the correction based on the Einstein relativity theory. Positioning of very high uh, precision have become possible. As precise positioning technology possible, autonomous, autonomous, autonomous vehicles are expected to come into use. This will bring great changes to the automobile technologies and how we use those automobiles. This may bring fundamental changes to the flow of people and good in the society. We can expect the social innovation and the creation of a new business. Various basic research have been conducted under the microgravity environment of the ISS, and we are gaining interesting knowledge and results in basic and applied science, in biology or life science. JAXA and our joint research partners have brought living mice back from the ISS to Earth 
and by investigating their tissues, such as bone and muscle at a molecular level, they discovered that there are differences between the gene expression of the mice that lived under 1G and uh, under uh, microgravity. Further, under microgravity, it is possible to make protein crystallization happen in a much higher quality than on Earth. Uh, our partner, Pharmanautics, highly appreciate those results to accelerate the development of new medicine. Last year, Japanese government issued a document called Space Industry Vision 2030. It aims at doubling the size of space market in Japan in the early 2030s. This uh, market scale includes not only space industrial products such as satellite, uh, rocket, and the related ground facility, but also the downstream industry using the big data from satellite and end users or space related industry benefiting from their space environment. To re uh, respond to such demand, it is important that we not only demonstrate the output space activities, but that we provide the outcomes rather than output of space activities for the society uh, through cooperation with the right partners. This shall enable us to bring about uh, new innovations from space to the society. Thank you very much. So thank you all for this uh, very inspiring presentations. And uh, we are now ready to move to the next part of this event. And I would like to invite uh, Jan Werner to take over the moderation for the second part. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. Thank you very much. And now we are going in the following mode. Uh, we have uh, some questions to the participants here on the podium. And afterwards, please consider already whether you are somebody who would like to have a discussion directly with them. I will ask afterwards six of you, and six of you only, to come here and be on the podium and have a discussion. So, but first I need, uh, okay, no, no, one back. Please one back. So the first question, no, one forward. Now we should do it only with you, so because you did it and I did it at the same time. Okay, global navigation system. We have several navigation systems right now in the world. By the way, Sputnik was the first, because the Sputnik technology was used to develop navigation at the other way around, because uh, the Western world did not know where Sputnik is, so they were using the navigation technology from ground. So I would like this one to ask to Robert. So Robert, what about global navigation systems, cooperation or competition? Well, I've already, I've already told you about my, my passion about the word or. Uh, I think I think it's an and. I think I think we compete for ideas and concepts for how we want to do the the global navigation, um, and then we cooperate on the use of those systems as we go forward. That would be the way I look at it. And I think um, we all have uh, different approaches, and doesn't mean they're right or wrong. They're just different. And I think as a community, we have to decide um, what we can do because we can't all afford the same systems. And I think if we can get to that global community where we pick a solution and run with it, we'll be okay. But we should compete for the ideas and come up with the concepts and see which one is the most viable for us to all use uh, as we go forward. Okay, um, just do we have another opinion, for instance, from Japan, Okomura-san? Yeah, I, I think you see uh, navigation itself is uh, uh, indispensable infrastructure for the society. So in this sense, I think uh, you see global service is not just competition, but uh, at the same time, you see cooperation is, 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 uh, is necessary for people's benefit. Uh, but uh, you see technology itself is uh, always competing with each other. So, uh, thinking of both uh, aspect of uh, navigation system, I, I think in the long run, you see competition will contribute to uh, enhancing people's life. That is basically my idea. Okay, thank you very much. We are going to the second question, 
Planetary defense, a national or global endeavor? Igor, what is your opinion? <laughs> I know you're going to answer, ask me about the defense. <laughs> okay. So, um, the answer looks very easy. So, it's uh, strange to expect that someone want to have the national program for the global disaster brought by asteroids or uh, the danger that comes on site that we cannot predict. So, uh, for sure, it looks a bit strange if some nations say we will defend our country from the global disaster and we make this program that absolutely efficient and we are safe. And uh, I want to see that guy who will come to the parliament or the government to say that. That would be a bit confusing, I guess. So th for sure it is the, uh, the mission for all agencies, not just the agencies, but for all, all the countries. Uh, the problem that we face is, is the, so the problems are, was they are not just just one, they at least two, is the efficiency of the system and the technology that, that we should possess, that we should develop to, to rescue and to save uh, our countries from, from that, that we need to reach. And that, that is one of our goal, of our cooperation and common research and uh, for our scientists and engineers. And the second thing is that th that danger looks so distant and far if, you, if we compare with existing problems. That is theoretic. That uh, it's hardly, I hardly believe that in the nearest, in the, say, coming months or even years, we find the solution and there would be something that consolidate us to say, guys, we need to do this. We need to allocate funds, find best scientists and engineers to solve these ideas. Look around, we have regional problems and quite contradictory opinions to that. And with this opinion, we cannot find the common solution of that. That's what we need to learn first. Then if we do this successfully, we understand that we may solve a global problems with the distant or remote danger and risks like uh, asteroid threat or something like that. But what we need to expect and we, we need to search is the, the way how we can come closer to, to, to that solution. Thank you. But can you imagine, and I ask each and every one of you, without, you do not have to answer, just you have to say yes or no, that's enough. Can you imagine, Igor, that we do something like a global alliance for planetary defense signing a document of memorandum of understanding, let's work together really in that field. I mean, what you said, you have the feeling, yes, we can. Huh? For the moment, I, I doubt. Actually. Ah! So that the people with existing situation and contradictions we have w between the, the countries that seriously sign, find the mechanisms and uh, allocate some funds. But I am sure that we have to do this. Okay. And the sooner than we expect if it is the answer. Is there a different opinion with one of you concerning cooperation in plan planetary defense? Any different opinion? Then five, we agree. Like a slogan yeah. or the common target to task. Yes. yes, we can. Just sit here and sign. Okay, I will bring the paper. My assistant is formulating it now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Igor. You are totally, yes. We go to the next uh, topic, and this is science and big data, a driver for innovation. Uh, um, and uh, I would like to ask this question first to Sylvain. Thanks, Jan. Well, I guess um, I'm clearly in the camp that believes that uh, big data and, and making data and information available to, to the masses is key um, to humanity, humanity's success going forward. 
Um, in the past, uh, usually governments were the holders of massive amounts of data because we put satellites in space and data collection systems in space and whatnot, and we had our own government scientists look at the data and analyze it. And I think over the last decade and some, we, more and more of the countries have started to put that information in the public eye, and we've seen fantastic benefit from that. So a whole downstream industry is now uh, uh, taking shape, has taken shape, is, is continuing to grow, and we're seeing many, many national and international benefits from giving open access to all of these people. So whether you're a researcher, whether you're a student, you're an engineer, or you're just a software application developer, giving you access to these applications allows everyone around you to benefit from the application that you're going to develop from that data. So clearly, I think it's the, uh, it's the way of the future. It's the way that we need to continue um, to encourage uh, governments to do and, and private enterprises where possible to make the data available to, uh, to all of the folks out there. And I guess coming from a, a microeconomic background, having worked at, uh, at a department called Industry Canada in Canada, um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge the fact that when you do equip these folks with the, uh, the tools uh, to build new applications that are going to be useful to your national economy, for example, tools that help mining companies get more efficient, uh, logistics companies be more, be more productive, um, it, it invariably helps your economic growth as well. So there's, a, there's a, a lot of dimensions in terms of benefits to a country to making sure that uh, our, our citizens and also the world has access to all of this data. If you look to this area of uh, science and big data and public and private activity or let's say science and business or something like that, where do you see the role of the space agencies and where do you see more the role of industry in this question or is it every, everybody is doing everything? Well, yes and yes at this point. Um, so clearly the role of, a, of an agency is to ensure that when we do put assets in space that are collecting data, other than defense type assets, of course, um, that we make sure that the social benefit of making that data available is recognized early on in the planning of that mission so that as we go forward and we look at launching a new data collection, scientific payload or whatever, that we do have in our budgets and we do have a plan when we get approval for the mission to make that data available out there. It's not cheap. You know, we do need massive IT systems to make sure that the data is available. So as an agency, we need to provide some leadership to continue to um, uh, motivate folks for the open data concept. Thank you. And uh, Jiang Yulong, so if you looked at the same perspective now from China, where do you see the role of a space agency and uh, industry with regard to science and big data? S space science and uh, da big data is a big driver for innovation for, uh, in space, not only, but also is a big future and a big, big market. Because space science is the original the source, uh, source power for the exploration space. So for engines, normally it's the very important rule in the making the policy to the public, public data, put the transfer the data to the market, to the application. So for the enterprise and the other company for market, and get data and to develop and the industry and the commercial. So different rule, I think, uh, Different the the, the the situation in the in the push the big data and the science this this moment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We go to the next question: space technology, an incubator for business, Mr. Samanath. And I would like to hear especially again: what is the role of a space agency? Does the space agency has to take care of that, or who takes care of if you say yes? to the question, which, which I imagine you can say. So, but how to do it? How to get space technology really in the field as to be an incubator for business? Traditionally, space technology has been developed by government-funded agencies. Um, now, I'm seeing a change, even for the exhibition here, I'm seeing some industries coming forward and putting up stalls. Uh, selling, creating products of their own. I believe the space technology has to move away from the traditionally government-funded systems to 
private funded systems, if it has to happen really in a magnitude which is quite big, I see in many of the companies today, even for the prime sponsors, that space business seems to be a, a small portion of their entire business spectrum. If it has to really grow to a bigger scale, the operations in the manufacturing, space launching, application side has to grow significantly. And I'm sure uh, it's going to happen. The last few years have shown the, the signature of many of these changes that is going to happen and it's being inspired by many people who are really um, venturing into this uh, area. Uh, with respect to what my agency do in India, it's, uh, we have been traditionally a government-funded agency to develop on the space technology and also applications for the people. But we have also created a, an arm, which is a commercial arm called Andrix, which is selling many of its uh, products in terms of remote sensing, launch services, etc. Uh, here also we see the incubation of business has to happen in many fields. For example, the current scenario of uh, small satellite clusters being launched uh, to do the remote sensing application, communication applications demand, it is not possible by centrally funded agencies like uh, ISRO or even any other agency to build these satellites and launch one satellite per day or even more rate. It actually means that you need to create industrial enterprises who is capable of producing that many satellites and really bring out the result out of this uh, the uh, large fleet of satellites. It actually, in both in building the satellites and creating applications and dissemination of this information down to the public, it, we need to create a total value chain of business. And I see it's going to happen, and uh, uh, that's the space from the traditional role of only doing searching and finding out. We will you know, create new business opportunities in the years to come. Thank you. Okumula-san. If we look to space technology, an incubator for business, so the main question is, of course, how do the knowledge, the data of space technology really leave the area to be used by others? So how can business have, in your case, in Japan, ex can have access to the space technology, to the space data? Do you give it free of charge? Do they have to pay? Do they have to be Japanese? or is it also possible for others? So how to handle this, this way from the space technology in space developed to business outside? Okay, uh, uh, first of all, the question uh, who gave me that uh, uh, free or charge, uh, it's uh, depending on the data. Uh, you see high resolution data, it should be, you see, uh, not free, yeah. Uh, this is uh, similar to for other countries, yeah. But uh, you see in Japan, you see, for instance, I'll give you a typical example uh, for the business. Uh, you see, JAXA operated uh, Air Eros uh, uh, satellite, uh, which gathers uh, us observation data, a lot of data. Uh, we analyzed this data and publicated it to one private companies, which uh, uh, build up, uh, you see, their business based on this data to, uh, to make uh, 3D mapping. Uh, you see, this mapping of, uh, all over the world, this, uh, the customers uh, for this uh, 3D mapping is uh, very, uh, ranges for very wide uh, business field. Not only, you see, farmers or uh, uh, whatever, so in this sense, you see data uh, from the uh, space uh, can create new businesses, I believe. In fact, I told you the, in my presentation uh, regarding the life science. So this is, uh, we should, you see, our people engaged in the space uh, should open new era by uh, making uh, innovation. Yeah, but again, I did not really understood at the very beginning you said some data should not be free of charge. Which one not? Which data should not be free of charge? Yeah, yeah depending, you see, that is, you see, uh, the data itself, you see. Uh, generally speaking, you see high resolution data. A high resolution high, data. High resolution, yes. Okay, so yeah. you are saying about Earth observation. What about technical data concerning developments, 
uh, of a rocket or whatever, which is done with public money, should that be available also to business? Uh, oh, actually, that uh, depends on the situation which you are talking about. So if you need to know more details, please contact me. Okay, uh, I will do so. <laughs> okay, I have your phone number. I will call you, of course. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, now we go to the next one already. From old new space to new old space. And I'm, it's clear, Robert, this is a question for you because the US is the inventor of what we call today new space, which is a little bit old already. So, so Robert. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that the challenge here is that this is really not old space, new space. It's actually your acquisition strategy as an agency. How as an agency are you gonna acquire the service you need? And so when we look at it in, in the environment today, as I said earlier, it used to be we were, we were the, only, the only funding source in town, and now we have people that are really doing this on their own. Um, and so how do we take advantage of that as an agency to get our missions done that we wanna get done? So the way I look at it is it becomes a question of acquisition strategy. Um, and, and, and at NASA, we've kind of put it into three different uh, buckets. The first is, is we want the things we want to lead, and that means that, that I want the intellectual property so that I can share it, just like you said, from a technology development perspective, I can share it with, uh, with many people um, so they can use it and take advantage of it and go forward. The second category is collaborate, where I work with industry, international partners or academia to help solve my problems. And in some cases there, we get into agreements where we, we have to debate where the intellectual property is and what can be shared and what can't be, but they help us get our mission done. And then the last category is simply just leverage. And leverage is a case where industry can do this already and there's really no reason for us to be in that business. And so I don't care what, what company it is, they're, whether, whether they're considered old or new, doesn't really matter, they can all operate in those regimes for us in terms of how we, how we acquire those services. In fact, they all do operate with us in that. The real question for us as an agency, where does NASA play in that, is the risk discussion, right? It's all about risk of what, it, what risk are we taking to get our mission done with our level of insight or oversight in that, in that acquisition strategy. So I think that's really the question, um, is, is the acquisition approach we take as an agency versus, versus who's doing it is really the approach we take. Okay, can you give the mic to Igor because I would like to hear, is there something like that also developing in Russia? So what is called new space that uh, in the private sector is more and more investing. Is there something also in Russia? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we think that for the moment we have a bit different system. We don't have all new, new old. We have, let's say, uh, traditional, regular kind of business that developed. That is uh, a joke, but what we need actually, if we, if we are serious. Uh, we face now uh, a new stage of development, and uh, one of the tasks, our goals, is to attract and devel develop a private initiative entrepreneurs in space business, because we need a new initiative and we want to see people who force us to be better and uh, work better, bringing new ideas. And uh, in the private sector, we see in the uh, United States and other countries that it brings a lot. That we've never done. But now we face this stage. So we want this, as Robert said, leverage, sharing the investments, new opportunities for business. That is the huge task that is set by our president and government. And next years, we need to develop it. This is one of the biggest challenge we never <coughs> faced, but we face now and want to, to be successful in, 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 in that sphere. Okay, thank you. Now you see the system, the system and of such a podium discussion works that they know a little bit about the questions we raise. Uh, now the difficulty for them will be that the next question was not discussed with them, which is unfair, you would say, uh, but they will live with it. Um, uh, we, 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 we mentioned that question, but we did not say whom I will ask and so on and so on. So I will make it easy for you 
So it will be started with Jean-Yves and then with Sylvain. And the question will be, the ideal headline news for your agency. That means for what, for what would you like that your agency to be perceived in the general public? So this, this question, so what would you like to read in the newspaper about your agency? It's a little bit unfair. I know you are saying now, you said you will not ask us, but I ask you because it's so important. So therefore, you, we start with uh, Jean-Yves, Sylvain. Yes, 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 you can. I can answer for all of you, that's no problem. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, Joif. No, Forkness is here. I will uh, answer as well as the last one, okay. Yes, uh, our headline news is uh, invent inventing the future of space. And uh, I think that it is uh, perfectly in accordance with this Congress because in inventing the future of space, uh, every word matters. Inventing, you feel, uh, innova you think uh, innovation, you think applications, and this is exactly what is at stake during uh, this week. Uh, the future, and I think that the future is uh, climate, because uh, if we want to have a future, we have to tackle climate change and to do it with cooperation. And space, of course, uh, if uh, I see the picture which has been shown by uh, Jan, it's uh, exploration with uh, this uh, young lady who went to space, and uh, exploration means uh, inspiration for the young generations. And so I think that uh, inventing the future of space is a very good headline news. Okay. Sylvain, headline. Um, I'd say that uh, the Canadian Space Agency is recognized as a global innovator and is an inspirational uh, organization for youth. Okay. Igor, a headline for Pravda, or I don't know. <laughs> so uh, I guess that it may be the event in the future that would be in, in the papers. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to see the headline in my, in my life that uh, we have a common mission international mission okay. to Moon or Mars, launched by new Russian <laughs> super heavy launcher from? by Cosmodrome. <laughs> from which? From where? From, from Cosmodrome Vostochny that we construct now. Okay. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> oh, that's too good. Um, <laughs> Too easy for me to answer. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I, I think for me, it's. I, I have. I have two. So because they could up both be the same, if we if we if we find what I think we might find. Uh, my first would be very similar to what we saw when we landed on the moon. Would be we did it, and it's about us getting to Mars as an international community. Boots on Mars. Um, the other one is the other one is a, a major part of our science portfolio, which is we confirmed life somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> That's a short uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, I'd like to know the EUC. Yeah, Jax uh, was uh, newly born, newly born to become the innovation driver uh, in the space and industry. Okay, thank you. Recently, in China TV, showed that most uh, space News is a lunar Mars exploration, exploration, technology innovation, and a series national development. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. ISRO is seen as a, an agency or an organization which is capable of doing things, fantastic things, at a very low price or a cost. And it has also revolutionized the way we looked at space in my country, which is actually struggling on various other fronts. Okay. So I would like to see this headline. ISRO inspires the next phase of science and technology revolution in this country. Thank you very much. <laughs> and for ESA, for ESA it's very simple. Australia becomes an associate member of ESA. Okay, now we come to the third part and I need six people. 
it must be the three G of uh, Jean-Yves. That means we need some diversity in geography, in gender, and also in age. So therefore, who is strong enough to come here? Let's first look for three ladies. Three ladies, please raise your hand. And three is more than one. Uh, please. Okay, then I select several. That's the other possibility. Philip, select one. So you see, I have helpers. Another one? Please, Lena, take another one. Okay, there we have another one. Come out, come to the stage, come to stage, come to stage. Okay, and the third one. And I three, need three men as well. Again, look to the different age, different age. So we need Randy, come on, come on. You yeah, are today. No, we need three men, we need three men. No, we have many ma ma female now. Oh, okay, we don't need any men, no man any longer, it's fine. One man, come up, come up. So now we need a mic for them. Give just one mic. So, who starts to have a question to them? You can raise a question, whatever you like. Go in front, go in front, no problem. I was standing here the whole time. It's no, it's, okay, okay, come on. Come on here, closer, closer. Ask them. I want to ask the question about education. Education for, uh, does anybody want to take on my son as a... <laughs> he does not want. So the question is clear. Who, who, has, who wants to say somebody? Uh, do you have somebody whom yeah. you want to, uh, uh, to ask? I, I really want to ask everybody. No, that's too much. Oh, okay. Just you can, one man is enough for you. Okay. One man. Yeah, one is enough. Select one. Never enough. Okay. Uh, I, please can I ask the French gentleman. Jean-Yves Legal. Yes. Education. What about education in space? Education in regards to those that have drives in a very young age towards... Like uh, yourself. To my, <laughs> like my yourself, son. okay. So Jean-Yves, please answer the question. No. <laughs> Excuse me, but I'm the master no, no, of the ceremony now. E education <laughs> is, uh, is very important because we need uh, very talented engineers. And uh, I am sure that uh, if you propose a young generation to work in the space field in the future, it's probably must, much more motivated than working in other fields. So it's a very good point for education space. Thank you. Oh, one person said... Huh? Okay, the next question, and also think about whom you would like to ask. Huh? Not all, one. <laughs> That's the problem of human. You have to select one. I can do that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So I'm wondering, what is your opinion about what's the greatest challenge of going to the moon and setting up a moon village, for example, or a base on the moon um, as an international effort? What is the greatest challenge? And who um, should answer? I would like to hear Mr. Lightfoots. Okay. Sorry. Robert, you have a mic? There is a mic. Now we take a man. Could, could you repeat one. that one more time? <laughs> okay. It was, yeah. the biggest was it the biggest challenge to get we to the moon? To have diversity. The question was? The biggest challenge to get to the moon? It's hard to hear. I couldn't hear that. Ah, the question was, what is the biggest challenge to go to moon or Mars? That uh, was in short. International. Internationally. Internationally. So uh, you can do it, we know, but uh, what about international? <laughs> I was going to. I was going to say we got a space launch system in Orion, and and we'll fly from Kennedy Space Center. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but no, I, I think that the. I, I don't know if it's as big a challenge as we think it is. I think we've used the International Space Station as a great example to to show international cooperation, um, and I've shown we can do it. And we put a, this beautiful orbiting laboratory uh, in low Earth orbit, and I think we'll just build off those same principles. Um, when we, go, when we go further into space, whether it's around the moon, on the moon, or to Mars. And what you'll see is that we now actually, from when we started the International Space Station, we have more cooperation and more international partners than we ever had before to get to that level. So I, I, think it's, I don't think it's going to be that complicated. Technically, we'll figure it out. I think um, the policy part of international cooperation, I think Space Station has paid that path for us, and we'll be able to do it. Yes, thank you. Uh, just for you, so it's really difficult to understand what we say here on the podium. So, Robert, I totally understand. It's very difficult to understand, especially these mics. You cannot understand. So, therefore, I try always to uh, explain it again. So, Timothy, the question and to whom? Okay. Uh, as an Australian, my question is um, 
uh, to all the, all the space agencies. Oh, no one. I'm going to start, say, uh, maybe ask the Canadian Space Agency as a country that's similar to uh, us in terms of size and economy. What should be the first priority for the Australian uh, Space Agency? Contents wise. What is the. F you understood? What is. Okay, no, 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 because of the. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's a really. That's a really difficult question. Um, and instead of going content wise from a technology perspective, let me go content wise from an organizational perspective. So the challenges. Um, with, space, with, with respect to national space programs are just select fantastic today. Person, there's, a no, there's a ton of things, there's a ton of opportunities that we can do. And of course, there's always limited resources, right? So putting in a sound governance system that will allow the space agency to, to make the right decisions, to prioritize what it should do, and, name, and to make sure that it can make the best this, pitch huh? possible to politicians to secure as much, as much funding as is required for this country to invest in space. I think would be a good first step. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, short question and who should answer? Yeah, the person from ISRO. I'm from okay. India, so I would like to um, hear from you. This is related to policy of a space agency. How does a space agency decide whether to plan for a lunar mission or a Mars mission? You got the question? Yeah, I okay. got the question, yes. Uh, moon is definitely closer to us, so if you are going <laughs> go there first, and once you have um, uh, the strong foothold on how to do it, you can go to Mars. And we are also doing the same thing. We first went to Moon, then we w went to Mars, and now we are looking at going to Venus and far away places. So. Uh, the, the way you travel, uh, the technology associated with are quite different compared to Moon and Mars. Moon is your planet, you are, uh, you are so close to it, it's within your gravity field, so you can go there easily, but it is quite a different, difficult story for Mars, and it will be still difficult if you want to travel farther. Thank you. <laughs> so again, one, and one different, that would be nice, not the same persons again, you understand? Okay. okay, you will do it. You will do it. <laughs> okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Nancy Wolfson, and I have a question about new practices in business. And we talk about entrepreneurship. Now, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs are very unpredictable. So my question goes: If we are welcoming those different characteristics of an entrepreneurship, are we ready? to make our space industry more accessible to those unique people that have those unique qualities that are already enhancing our space industry? And what will be those doors that will access, that will allow them access with those unique ideas? And again, many of them unpredictable ideas that are enhancing our space industry. I hope I was clear. <laughs> Um, and this goes for, um, you said someone that I... Ah, oh, you can select one of them, but only okay. one. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Leporti? No, it's silver. Oh. For you, it's silver. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> silver, you, you got the question. So, how to get disruptive ideas into the business? Uh, how to, because usually the, the doors are closed. Uh, we did it uh, differently the last 100 years and so on. So, how to get... This is the question. Uh, how to get disruptive ideas into space? Okay, well, that's interesting. You, you, you didn't understand this, the question the same way I did. See, she's going to correct you. <laughs> yeah, no. The question is, if we're welcoming those new practices in business, okay, so... <laughs> Go closer, then he can understand you better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a good way. Okay, excellent. So my question is, and, and this has to do with my own research, Okay, when it comes to entrepreneurship in our space industry. So if we are willing to let those entrepreneurs into our industry, it mean, meaning welcoming them, we need to have doors open for them. Mm -hmm. But what will be those doors? And are we ready to truly open the, door, the doors of, a spa of our space industry to, 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 to those new um, 
entrepreneurs with very unique and unpredictable characteristics. And what will be those doors? Okay, so <laughs> stay, stay here, stay here. Oh, wow. okay. So in fact, um, you're talking about opening doors. I, I would probably start by saying the door is open, uh -huh. right? And, and we do deal with quite a number of entrepreneurs. Um, constantly, they, they bring this, this fresh idea. In fact, I tell you that um, my experience in, in Canada, we're seeing venture capitalists now looking for opportunities to invest in young entrepreneurs going forward. So where that did not exist before because financiers were afraid of you know investing in such a, a risky and long-term proposition, now we're seeing them realize how effective space can be for their investments. And we're seeing VCs now taking, uh, venture capitalists now taking the steps to encourage entrepreneurs and to provide them with the funding. Where are those steps? What are those steps is the question? Japanese, however, it's difficult. Um, I do not understand you. In terms of contributing to an agency? Yeah, in terms of collaborating and opening the, the doors. No, no, do it. If you, if you select another one. Okay, so now I prefer Jan's version of the question. Sure. I'm sorry okay. if it is complicated. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank so, you. the next one, please. So please, your question and look to yes. the gentleman whom you would like to select for that question only, of course. Uh, I would like to ask the gentleman representing JAXA. Yes. Um, in your opinion, in light of the wonderful news today that Australia is establishing a space agency, what is the next country you would like to see joining you on this stage? You understood the question? Actually, I don't know. No. <laughs> Which country is in okay, uh, some, after Australia? I don't know. Some other ideas? Uh, yeah. Which country you would like to see on stage of, with space? Yes. Some other answer, please. <laughs> no? Nobody? There are so many countries. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. Yeah. yeah. You have an answer, I see. Huh? Yeah, I see it. I see it. I see I'd it. I'd like to see United Arab Emirates, uh, Iraq, Iran. I'd like to see uh, Vietnam, uh, Mexico. Uh, so that we all cooperate. Now I have a question for you, Jan. <laughs> that was not hey, the There's plan. a piece of space rock, asteroid. Yes. And it's coming at Germany. Yes. It was discovered, let's say, by uh, NEOWISE, a U.S. satellite. You have 20 years. Who's going to do what? Who's going to do what? Who's going to take what assignment here? 20 years. Go, go, go. Okay, I'm in Paris, by the way. So for me, it's no problem with no, Germany. No, 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 no. <laughs> no I, think, okay. I think it's close yes, enough. Okay, we need all of you. I need, of course, the spacecraft from, uh, from uh, US. Maybe I need the nuclear power from Russia. Uh, <laughs> I need the navigation system. <laughs> From Europe, I need the navigation system from Europe. Um, I need some good ambassadorship to promote it by Canada. And the Japanese and the Chinese will join together and uh, look for how to communicate this to the uh, German people that, they, that we cannot avoid the impact. So, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So. Um, hi, I would like to leave my question open to whoever would like to answer. No, you have to decide. Oh, I have to decide. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I'll go with you. Jean-Yves Legal, oh, okay, good. Yeah. Um, so, as an Australian student, I feel like we have access to a lot of data and are inspired and want to go into the space industry. But the difficulty we seem to be having is actually getting access to that data and what do we do with it from there. So my question is if you could give one piece of advice to Australian students or students across the world, what would be your advice? 
No, if, <coughs> I think that uh, what is very important if you want uh, to be successful in space is to work on concrete projects. Uh, now there is a national uh, space agency in Australia and uh, you will have a lot of people uh, who are going to explain to you uh, this is the strategy that uh, Australia must develop. But in fact, uh, I think that uh, more than strategy, you need projects because uh, I do prefer to have uh, projects without strategy than a strategy without projects. It's very important. And if you have projects, very concrete projects about climate change, about uh, uh, science, about telecommunication and so on, you will learn a lot about space and it will be very, very re rewarding. Not a friend, maybe it's... So you do it. You do it. Okay. So please, go ahead. Uh, my question is to Jan. To me? Yes. I had already one. It was difficult enough. Okay, go ahead. Um, as an international community, uh, what, do we, what do we do when the interests of uh, profit no longer align to what's best for the planet or the solar system? Yeah, so for me, uh, this is a question which is, of course, in my heart because it's very easy to convince politicians to do a space mission where they get a direct return of investment. And I always give the same example to con con convince people that they should not do like this. If you know Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein some hundred years ago wrote the theory of relativity. He wrote the, the general theory of relativity and the special theory of relativity. And according to these two theories, time is dependent on velocity and time is dependent on gravity. He formulated that and for decades this series had no value, just scientific value. No return of investment, nothing happened. But then we created, not me but the Americans, the navigation system. And in the navigation system you, you need accurate clocks on board of the satellites. The satellites are 24,000 or even more uh, kilometers far above, so the gravity is lower, therefore time is running faster. And they are running rather fast, therefore the time is running slower on board of the satellites. If you would not know about this very fundamental results, which were for decades, not, not, did not have any value, the accuracy of a navigation system would be wrong by 500 meter in one hour. And this is, from my perspective, convincing that there is always something like return of investment, even if it's only inspiration, fascination, motivation. Thank you. So. Hi, um, my name is Vienna, and my question is for uh, Mr. Yu Long. Um, my question is, with the um, increasing globalization and... Okay, fine. <laughs> I was just thinking why are you having a question to him, but it's okay, it's from University in Adelaide. Yeah, I live here. Okay, fine, go ahead. <laughs> um, with the increasing globalization and um, collaboration happening in between the space agencies, what is the possibility that China can join the International Space Station and why? <clears throat> <laughs> Robert, would you also like to? <laughs> no, no, please, no, no, it's you. <laughs> the, the, the question. So we are done. Yeah? Yes. Should uh, ask the NASA? Uh, yes, uh, the Warner may be better. <laughs> but I think so. Chen uh, like to join the uh, Internet uh, Space Station. Uh, Chen, uh, myself, developed a Space Station. We master some technology and serves some of the science and some of the uh, new era included uh, the medicine, uh, biological, and so on. I think internet, international cooperation is a future big direction, di direction, I think so. So your hope co cooperation, I should I support you. I like to cooperation. Thank you. Okay. So, Thank you very much for, for letting us do this uh, experiment. It was very new for the podium. It was new for you as well. Of course, Jean-Yves, thank you very much also for you that, you that we could do it together. Of course, what would be nice that we get afterwards some reaction, whether this is a format you say, ah, it's no, we want to hear each and every one for talking for one hour or whatever. Give us some uh, response afterwards. But Jean-Yves, you, you started, you are, have also the final words. Thank you very much to all of you. <laughs>
Yeah, also thank you to you. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Jan, uh, to have uh, organized this uh, quite uh, innovative discussion. I think that innovation is a key word of the session. And uh, I hope that uh, it has been uh, very interactive with uh, our audience. And uh, I think that uh, this is probably the new space to discuss directly, uh, to exchange, and uh, to invent the future of space. So thank you to our all panelists. I propose that we applaud. And uh, thank you for all of you. We made uh, this session so much interesting. Thank you.